So I think we'll start out, first of all, by um, looking at what is by becoming almost as common, I think, as infections. Certainly infections were up there, dislocations are there, but periprosthetic fractures are rapidly climbing due to the aging osteopenic population. So here we have an example of a 72-year-old male fell down, relatively insignificant past history, community ambulator, used a walker, and um, during the operation um, when we went in on this, you noted to have a well-fixed acetabular component, no significant polyethylene liner wear, but his uh, femoral component was basically loose, easy to take out. So what we have to do is develop an approach to these periprosthetic fractures. So when we look here, um, what does this represent? Obviously, we want to classify this using the Vancouver classification. And um, Vancouver A would be um, a revision of a femoral component to a cementous stem with fixation of the, of the fracture. B1, revision of a femoral component to a cemented stem with fixation of the fracture. A B1, revision of femoral component to a long, porous, coated, cementless stem with fixation of the fracture. A B2 would be using plate and cerclage fixation of, of the fracture. And finally, revision of the femoral component to a long, porous, coated, cementless stem. So we have to analyze this and say, OK, what are we really trying to do here. So we have what appears to be a loose stem. So the issue is here, what of these answers, what is the best answer for this? And in this particular case, without a doubt, we want to revise this femoral component to a long porous coated stem with fixation of the fracture. Significantly, fixation of the fracture with a plate and cerclage wires is not the answer because the stem is loose. Revision to a long porous coated cementless stem with fixation of the fracture, well, that's wrong because it's not a B1 fracture. We have to understand, and we'll go through what a B1 and B2 is, but that's the difference. That's why it's five and not three, because in reality, it is a loose stem, not a stem that's, uh, that is um, stable. And obviously, we don't use cemented stems, and it's not a type A fracture. So having this in mind, and that probably was the most common type of fracture you'd see, what we're looking at here is when we deal with periprosthetic fractures, fracture around a total hip, increasing incidence, as I mentioned. Classification, they're either intraoperative fractures of the femur or the acetabulum. Acetabulum is much less rare or post-operative fractures of the femur or acetabulum. Again, different treatment somewhat for post-operative versus intraoperative fractures. Epidemiologically, intraoperative fractures, 3.5% of primary uncemented hip replacements develop intraoperative fractures, mostly because of these dual-wedged type of um, implants now that tend to create more of these metaphyseal fractures. Rare to occur during cementless ar cemented arthroplasties, and post-operative fractures are actually um, significantly lower than the intraoperative fractures. So again, we have to really be careful, try and do prevention. Prevent, prevent preoperative templating certainly reduce the risk of these intraoperative fractures. You want to make sure that you don't put in a stem that's too large. Make sure you get appropriate radiographs. Adequate surgical exposure. Don't make the incision too small. And larger people, make sure you can see before you put in the implant. Also, beware that rheumatoid arthritic patients, especially in females who also have osteoporosis, these are the increased risks. So you have to be more careful with these particular uh, type of patients. Now, intraoperative acetabular fractures, they are, are somewhat more rare than the femoral side. They occur rarely with cemented acetabular components, more common with cementless acetabular components, obviously because you have to bang these things in harder. They typically occur during impaction 
of the acetabular component. The risk factors, risk factors, under reaming by two millimeters, that's a bit of a stretch. Probably more recommend now one millimeter. Elliptical cups, cups that are not pure hemispheres, dual geometries, things like that. Again, the osteoporotic patient is at risk. All cementless acetabular components. The dysplastic patients have bone that is asymmetric. You very often will have one of the walls, especially in females, the anterior wall often is weak and you can end up with a fracture. And certainly patients who have had radiation, such as in radiation necrosis. Intraoperative fracture evaluation. You have to determine the stability of the implant. You have to, once you put it in, you've got to test it. Puss on the edges. So determine implant stability is the, is the number one issue. Intraoperative fractures, if the implant is stable, then, and, found, and you find this intraoperatively, you know to crack, make sure you put some screws in and protect these patients for three months. That's the best in, uh, uh, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Don't try to be a hero to the patient. Make sure the answer is protect these patients, even if you determine that they're stable and properly. Certainly, the indications for revision, if you even think that this fracture is even somewhat unstable, you have to, have to remove the acetabular component, put in a larger component, something that is going to be maybe one or two sizes larger, Fix the fracture with a plate and use screws. Add bone grafts uh, from the, uh, uh, to try and fill in any of the fractures that are still uh, apparent and protected weight bearing. Again, if you even think that this cup is unstable, you have to go through these steps. Bigger cup, plate, and the use of screws. So let's look at another question. We have a 78-year-old female, undergoes a total hip, minimally invasive, already smaller incision, increased risk. During insertion of metaphyseal stem fixation with a cementless press fit technique, there's a crack in the calcar identified. The stem is removed, two cable wires are passed around the calcar, and the stem is reinserted. Which of the following statements is true? The patient should be advised she's at greater risk for subsidence. Female sex is a risk factor for a intraoperative calcar fracture. A better outcome would be expected if you just simply went to a long stem. Cementless press fit technique is not a risk factor. MIS, minimally invasive surgery, is a factor. So when we look at this, which would be the most correct answer? And certainly the most correct answer is, as I mentioned, females are at a much increased risk because they are osteoporotic. MIS certainly is somewhat of a risk, but if you're good at it, um, it's less of a risk, but certainly is there. Um, press fit is not a significant risk factor. That's the wrong answer because it is definitely increased risk for fracture as opposed to cement stems. And um, certainly patients need to be advised that there is some increased risk for potential subsidence. And Certainly, a small crack does not warrant using a long, a long stem. So again, the female gender is the ticket. That's the increased risk. Periprosthetic fractures, intraoperative femoral fracture. Again, when we look at this, revisions are at a much greater risk for these periprosthetic fractures. They usually occur proximally and during bone preparation and prosthetic insertion. These are the middle range fractures occur when extensive force is used. That is, during a surgical exposure, preparing the bone, you need to take it easy. Don't have an aggressive assistant rotate the leg. You want to try and make sure you have adequate exposure for this. So when we look at intraoperative femur fractures with distal fractures, this is because you're trying to put a straight stem in a femur that's curved. The anterior aspect of the femur bows at different, le different levels or lengths depending on the height of the patient. And it usually you happens when you have a straight implant 
that engages the anterior cortex. Even with a slight bow, this is where these occur. Intraoperative x-ray certainly can be helpful. So, usually, the, again, intraoperative femoral fractures are at increased risk during impaction bone grafting because you're banging that tapered stem in pretty hard. Again, female gender, cementless imp imp implants, osteoporosis. These are the main. So the theme that continues is females, cementless, osteoporosis. If there is a change in resistance when you're inserting this stem, that is all of a sudden you're banging the stem, it's harder to get in, this should alert you that a fracture has a, a, is, is potentially going to occur if you smack it a few more times and all of a sudden it advances, you've smacked it 10 times and then it didn't advance, only a millimeter, then it advances more, all of a sudden, two or three times more, it's a fracture until proven otherwise, you've got to obtain an x-ray. This is probably the thing that people try to overlook the most. Well, just advance more. No, if it advances all of a sudden more, you have to rule out a fracture. So let's go ahead and try and classify some of these intraoperative femur fractures. When we look at Vancouver classification, which is the most um, uh, popular, we have to look at location, the pattern, and the stability of the fracture. Is it proximal, diaphyseal, or distal to the stem, or is it a simple perforation, a non-displaced crack, or do we have an unstable fracture pattern? So when we look at the interoperative um, uh, fractures here, this is these are examples here of what we're talking about, um, for perforations, or whether we have um, fractures that are more, more than a perforation, fractures that become somewhat displaced, remain proximal, and then so on down the line. So interoperative radiographs are required when there is a concern for a fracture. If you suspect it, get an x-ray, get an AP and lateral. So treatment of intraoperative fractures, stem removal, cabling, and reinsertion. You just don't want to just leave the stem in and put wires around it. Stem removal, that's the key. An interoperative longitudinal calcar split, that's the number one indication for this treatment. Trochanteric fixation with wires, cables, or a claw plate. Again, this is, you can take your choice depending on whether or not the, the, you feel you can get a adequate fixation with cables or you have to go to a claw plate. Removal of an implant and insertion of a longer stem prosthesis. This is indication when you have a complete two-part fracture in the diaphyseal or middle region. And then you have to bypass the fracture by two cortical diameters. You can use cortical struts if you feel that the, the bone is osteopenic or for a little extra fixation, but primarily the stability of the fracture should come from the implant itself. Then removal of the implant, internal fixation with plate, and reinsertion of the prosthesis. This is for distal fractures that cannot be bypassed with a long stem prosthesis. So what you do then after removal of the implant, you have to do a subsequent or an additive fixation um, in these particular cases. You have to do supplemental fixation with, in, with the plate if you cannot bypass. For instance, if the stem extends down into, or the fracture and the stem extend down into the um, distal metaphysis. So when we look at the Vancouver classification as it applies to the intraoperative femur fractures, we have to look at the A1 type of fracture, proximal metaphysis, cortical perforation, just a bone graft. These are not an issue. The, the more common is probably going to be the proximal metaphys metaphysis that's non-displaced or cracked. Circlage wire before inserting the stem. This prevents propagation. The name of the game here, prevent 
propagation. Circlaw's wire, whenever there is a tiny non-displaced crack, can be a bigger fully displaced crack. And then when you get in proximal taff assist that's displaced, fully porous coated stem or taper, or, or taper fluted stem provided, if there's an associated greater trochanteric fracture, you want to go with the cable plate. But again, noting that this is diaphyseal fixation, even though it's proximal taphesis, the reason we select fully coated or tapered, we want to bypass the fracture with stable fixation and fix the fracture above this. When we get into the diaphyseal regions, regions and we have cortical perforations, usually during cement removal, we want to go with fully porous coated stems. Again, the bypass rule of two cortical diameters not that often do we have to use truck grafts. Diaphyseal non-displaced cracks, cracks from increased hoop stresses that occur during broaching. I think if you have to determine if the implant is stable, do a torque test, put a, a proximal um, um, torque wrench or device on to make sure that that stem is stable rotationally, and then sub subsequently use circlage wire. Again. Fully porous coated stem to bypass the defect. And finally, when we have a diaphyseal displaced unstable fracture, which can occur, unfortunately, during hip dislocation or cement removal or insertion, when it's too aggressive, you have bone that is, is relatively poor, I think a good idea after you've bypassed the, um, the defect, you should probably use strut allografts. For these. And then finally, the van interoperative C types where it's distal to the stem and you have a perforation distal to the stem, morselized graft, fully porous coated stem, again, continuously bypassing the defect. And when it's completely distal to the stem and displaced, that's just simply open reduction, internal fixation. It's as if the stem was not there. This becomes purely a fracture operation. So let's go ahead and look at this. Let's look at a question. So which of the following fractures that we're going to show would most likely require revision arthroplasty with a long stem uncemented prosthesis? Again, uncemented, we're not using cement anymore to treat periprosthetic fracture. So here we go. When we look at this A, B, C, D, or E, in A we have what appears to be a stable stem, but we also have a, a stable um, implant from a knee prosthesis. Very little distance between the two. The second one, we have a fracture of the metaphysis that occurs. This is the common fracture that you very often will see with insertion of these, these double or single tapered wedge prosthesis. Either will occur um, intraoperatively sometime, more likely post-op. C is a what appears to be a stable component on the femoral side with osteolysis. D appears to be a stable femoral component, knee, knee, uh, knee component below, and then a E appears to be a fracture that the femoral component looks like it subsided. So which would most likely require revision arthroplasty with a long stemmed component? So remember, which of these can you get a long stem component in? And the obvious answer here is B, because all of the others do not allow for insertion of, of a long stem prosthesis. We'll just go back, look at the x-ray. The only one of these that a long stem, that's a key word, can get in is in B because of obstruction from the knee prosthesis. C is, is stable anyways, and E, the implant is, 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 is loose. So when we look here, postoperative femur fractures, 0.1 to 3% primary cementless total hips, early post-op fractures, Again, cementless prosthesis usually tend to fracture in the first six months 
usually, as I mentioned, they're from the wedge tapered stems. Um, cylind cylindrical fully coated stems, distal cortical tip fractures, not very common. Late post-operative fractures usually occur with cemented fractures, and these very often are in osteopenic patients. Could be from trauma, also um, from maybe some slight subsidence of maybe a tapered stem. Again, risk factors, poor quality bone, cementless prosthesis, revision prosthesis as well. So when we try to classify these post-operative femoral fractures, again, the most important thing is the stability of the implant. Is that femoral component stable or not? And what's the quality of the surrounding bone? Because the more, the poorer the quality of the surrounding bone, the more challenging this is going to be and you may have to use some supplemental fixation, strut grafts, even plates. It can be difficult to differentiate between B1s and B2s based on radiographs alone. Sometimes, sometimes those B1 fractures can really be B2s. That is, the implant is loose. So sometimes you need to get a history and serial radiographs. This is probably the most important slide you need to know when it comes to treating periprosthetic fractures. The Vancouver type A's, these are the ones you're going to see with increasing frequency, the greater and lesser trochanters with implant stable. The B1 fracture around or just below the tip, this is a stable implant. That's the key. That's what has to be differentiated from the B2. Unstable implant, but bone quality is pretty good. B3, loose stem. We don't have it on the picture here, but the bone quality is poor. It may change your stem cell, stem type of selection. We'll get into that a little bit later. And then the type C bone or the type C fracture. It's independent of the implant. Implant is stable, and we have to deal with the fracture below the prosthesis. So fractures in the trochanteric regions, this is the classic picture. Stable implant, polyethylene wear, debris generation creates a osteolytic lesion. If it's allowed to expand, the most common fracture is in the uh, greater trochanter. And if the fracture is, di is displaced, you may want to consider fixation. But remember, a lot of these are poor quality bone, and some of these are, many of them are not amenable to, to fixation. So we have to judge the quality of the bone in these cases. Um, and so that is, that is something that we really have to assess. Non-displaced fractures of the greater trochanter, non-operative treatment with protective weight bearing. You don't want to change the polyethylene until the fracture heals and the pain goes away. Even if it's a fibrous union, these patients do better when the inflammatory reaction has subsided. We just try to limit abduction in these patients. When we do decide to repair these, I believe it's important to assess the bone. Um, if these are somewhat displaced and we decide we're going to be able to get fixation and that the bone is of good enough quality to allow for plate fixation, I believe that probably the, the I think the cable claw plate that extends down distally is better than just a simple um, claw and we can bone graft these with some cancellous bone. But again, you have to use a judgment in these cases looking at the quality of bone. B1 fracture, again, emphasize at the bottom of this slide, must be certain stem is not loose. Certainly, um, circlage, ca circlage cables and the most modern type of locking plate, the plate that you are the most familiar with that you can get locking screws in. Look at, at, put at the bottom of this slide, 
you can see in these B1. On the left, this looks like a B1. You cannot be fooled. A, B, a B1 that is treated like a B1, but in actuality is a loose femoral component, all of these internal fixations will fail. When we look at the radiograph on the right. This is the extent of which these locking plates have to be used, but the stem must be stable. These are increasing in numbers um, as a result of the fact that the patients are living longer, they're more osteoporotic. These are going to maybe be the most common um, type of fractures in the future. Right now, we're looking at B2s as late loosening of some of these already stable, proximally coated femoral components, these fracture and then these become loose. And you have to, again, recognize celiac radiographs are helpful, making sure that these are not stable, they're loose. These are revised to long porous coated stems and fixation of the fracture fragment and you revise the acetabular component if it's old or if it's malpositioned. Remember, you want to check the position of the acetabular component because after you operate, these could have a tendency to dislocate second time around after um, invasive surgery. So when we have a B2 fracture, the it's right now Probably the choice depends on what you're familiar with, modular tapered stem or cylindrical porous stem. The more isthmus you have, the probably better chance you have of getting a cylindrical porous coated stem to work. The less isthmus you have below the fracture might be an indication for modular tapered stem. And also of consideration, we published on this, when you have these B2 or B3 fractures, we an extended trochanteric osteotomy can be used to create three-part fracture. Why? It sounds counterintuitive. Consider it. It makes the operation much easier in order to um, get the stem potted distally than close a fracture. Just something to be aware of, and this has been published. And finally, in these B3 fractures, where we have, we're revising the femoral component. If the bone is of poor quality sometime and the patient is older, possible proximal femoral replacement is indicated. Proximal femoral allografts are much less common for these fractures um, than they were. So, in these, in the very young patient, proximal femoral allografts can be indicated. The indication for proximal femoral replacement would be in the elderly low demand. So that would differentiate the fractures in these B, these B3 type fractures, implant selection or technique selection based on the age of the of the patient. And then finally, the type C fracture. That is where the implant is stable, but the fracture is below the implant, not involving the implant. This is where we don't touch the acetabular component or the femoral component, and we do open reductional internal fixation with, with a plate. Um, <clears throat> very often, um, circlage wires and cables are used proximally, bicortical screws distal to the stem, and if you can use in the newer plates, the unicortical locking screws can be used proximally. And because of the poor quality bone, I think supplemental, supplemental um, strut allografts uh, certainly can be indicated. So let's look at a question here. Which of the following fractures would best treat, be treated by open reduction with a locking plate and a circlage wire? locking plate and a cerclage wire. So we have A, here's a type C fracture, obviously it's below the prosthesis. Type B, 
looks like a loose implant so locking plate uh, is out so obviously figure a is the correct answer interprosthetic femur fracture in between a total hip and total knee prosthesis this is your classic example of a Vancouver C fracture tree with a locking plate and cerclage wire retain the components why definition Vancouver C implants are stable so let's go to post-operative femur fractures fracture the trochanteric region again same thing osteolysis consider open reduction internal fixation of these trochanteric fractures fracture a B1 again open reduction internal fixation using cerclage cables and locking plates implant must be stable must document I cannot emphasize that enough then the B2s implant comes out long pores coated stem to fix the fracture and make sure the acetabular component is fine you can't ignore that and you're always going to change the poly but make sure the position is correct and then the B3 young patient proximal uh, femoral allograft old patient older more infirm proximal femoral replacement and finally the type C fracture as we just showed open reduction internal fixation with a plate retain those components so um, so now what we go we go here is a 82 year old male so age makes a difference sustain a fell down here's this injury which treatment most describes what we have here so we have to look here knee prosthesis below femoral component is a femoral component stable well you're not going to treat this closed you're not going to treat this non-operatively so open reduction fixation with a plate and screws and cables open reduction fixation with a cortical allograft and strut revision with bridging of the fracture with plate and screws and cerclage wires a little bit tougher total film replacement so one in five are out so we have to look here are you are you going to Open reduction, internal fixation with the plate and screws. Are you going to take out these components? So when we look, it's again open reduction and fixation with the plate and screws. Why? Because these patient, this patient has stable components. There's increasing incidence of these kind of fractures because many of these patients have ipsilateral hip and knee arthroplasties, especially long revision. Um, femoral components in the knee. Why? Because these are osteoporotic patients. So that's the reason. So we're basically done with periprosthetic fractures. I think in summary you need to know whether or not the, the fracture occurs during insertion of the components. You have to make sure that the patient is at not a, you're not dealing with a higher risk patient such as a female osteoporosis. You also want to make sure that when you're dealing with periprosthetic fractures that that stem, if it's stable, you fix it with plates, and screws, and wires. If it's unstable, you have to change it. That's kind of in a nutshell and knowing when these patients are at risk, making sure when you use long stems, you don't perforate the anterior cortex. That's kind of in a nutshell bit of a summary of what we talked about. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.